Chapter 2 of the Boy Scouts Book of Campfire Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. The Boy Scouts Book of Campfire Stories. Chapter 2 The Wild Horse Hunters. Part 2 by Zane Gray. In the early morning, when all was gray and the big dark pines were shadowy specters, Sloane was awakened by the cold. His hands were so numb that he had difficulty starting a fire. He stood over the blaze, warming them. The air was nipping, clear and thin and sweet with frosty fragrance. Daylight came while he was in the midst of his morning meal. A white frost covered the ground, and crackled under his feet as he went out to bring in the horses. He saw fresh deer tracks. Then he went back to camp for his rifle. Keeping a sharp lookout for game, he continued his search for the horses. The forest was open and park-like. There were no fallen trees or evidences of fire. Presently he came to a wide glade, in the midst of which Nagger and the packed Mustang were grazing with a herd of deer. The size of the latter amazed Sloane. The deer he had hunted back on the Sevier range were much smaller than these. Evidently these were mule deer, closely allied to the elk. They were so tame they stood facing him curiously, with long ears erect. It was sheer murder to kill a deer standing and watching like that, but Sloane was out of meat and hungry and facing a long, hard trip. He shot a buck, which leaped spasmodically away, trying to follow the herd, and fell at the edge of the glade. Sloane cut out a haunch, and then, catching the horses, he returned to camp, where he packed and saddled, and at once rode out on the dim trail. The wilderness of the country he was entering was evident in the fact that as he passed the glade where he had shot the deer a few minutes before, there were coyotes quarreling over the carcass. Sloane could see ahead and on each side several yards, and presently he ascertained that the forest floor was not so level as he had supposed. He had entered a valley, or was traversing a wide, gently sloping pass. He went through thickets of juniper and had to go around clumps of quaking asp. The pines grew larger and farther apart. Cedars and pinions had been left behind, and he had met with no silver spruces after leaving camp. Probably that point was the height of a divide. There were banks of snow in some of the hollows on the north side. Evidently, the snow had very recently melted, and it was evident also that the depth of snow through here had been fully ten feet, judging from the mutilation of the juniper trees where the deer, standing on the hard frozen crust, had browsed upon the branches. The quiet of the forest thrilled Sloane, and the only movement was the occasional gray flash of a deer or coyote across a glade. No birds of any species crossed Sloane's sight, he came presently upon a lion track in the trail, made probably a day before. Sloane grew curious about it, seeing how it held, as he was holding, to Wildfire's tracks. After a mile or so, he made sure the lion had been trailing the stallion, and for a second he felt a cold contraction of his heart. Already he loved Wildfire, and by virtue of all this toil of travel considered the wild horse his property. No lion could ever get close to wildfire, he soliloquized with a short laugh. Of that, he was absolutely certain. The sun rose, melting the frost, and a breath of warm air laden with the scent of pine moved heavily under the huge yellow trees. Sloane passed a point where the remains of an old campfire and a pile of deer antlers were further proof that Indians visited this plateau to hunt. From this camp, broader, more deeply defined trails led away to the south and east. 
Sloane kept to the east trail in which Wildfire's tracks and those of the lion showed clearly. It was about the middle of the forenoon when the tracks of the stallion and lion left the trail to lead up a little draw where grass grew thick. Sloane followed, reading the signs of Wildfire's progress and the action of his pursuer as well as if he had seen them. Here the stallion had plowed into a snowbank, eating a hole two feet deep. Then he grazed around a little, then on and on. There his splendid tracks were deep in the soft earth. Slow knew what to expect when the track of the lion veered from those of the horse, and he followed the lion tracks. The ground was soft from the late melting of snow, and Nagger sunk deep. The lion left a plain track. Here he stole steadily along. There he left many tracks at a point where he might have halted to make sure of his scent. He was circling on the trail of the stallion, with cunning intent of ambush. The end of this slow, careful stalk of the lion, as told in his tracks, came upon the edge of a knoll where he had crouched to watch and wait. From this perch he had made a magnificent spring, Sloan estimating it to be forty feet. But he had missed the stallion. There were wildfire's tracks again, slow and short, and then deep and sharp, where in the impetus of fright he had sprung out of reach. A second leap of the lion, and then lessening bounds, and finally an abrupt turn from wildfire's trail told the futility of that stalk. Sloane made certain that wildfire was so keen that as he grazed along he had kept to open ground. Wildfire had run for a mile, then slowed down to a trot, and he had circled to get back to the trail he had left. Sloan believed the horse was just so intelligent. At any rate, Wildfire struck the trail again and turned at right angles to follow it. Here, the forest appeared perfectly level. Patches of snow became frequent and larger as Sloan went on. At length, the patches closed up, and soon extended as far as he could see. It was soft, affording difficult travel. Sloan crossed hundreds of deer tracks, and the trail he was on evidently became a deer runway. Presently, far down one of the aisles, between the great pines, Sloan saw what appeared to be a yellow cliff far away. It puzzled him and as he went on he received the impression that the forest dropped out of sight ahead then the trees grew thicker obstructing his view presently the trail became soggy and he had to help his horse the mustang floundered in the soft snow and earth cedars and pinions appeared again making travel still more laborious all at once there came to Sloan a strange consciousness of light and wind and space and void. On the instant, his horse halted with a snort. Sloan quickly looked up. Had he come to the end of the world? An abyss, a canyon, yawned beneath him, beyond all comparison in its greatness. His keen eye, educated to desert distance and dimension, swept down and across, taking in the tremendous truth before it staggered his comprehension. But a second sweeping glance, slower, becoming intoxicated with what it beheld, saw gigantic cliff steps and yellow slopes dotted with cedars, leading down to clefts filled with purple smoke, and these led on and on to a ragged, red world of rock. Bare, shining bold uplifted in mesa dome peak and crag clear and strange in the morning light still and sleeping like death this then was the great canyon which had seemed like a hunter's fable rather than truth sloan's sight dimmed blurring the spectacle and he found that his eyes had filled with tears he wiped them away and looked again and again until he was confounded by the vastness and grandeur and the vague sadness of the scene. Nothing he had ever looked at had affected him like this canyon, 
although the Stuarts had tried to prepare him for it. It was the horse hunter's passion that reminded him of his pursuit. The deer trail led down through a break in the wall. Only a few rods of it could be seen. This trail was passable, even though choked with snow, but the depth beyond this wall seemed to fascinate Sloane and hold him back, used as he was to desert trails. Then the clean mark of Wildfire's hoof brought back the old thrill. This place fits you, Wildfire, muttered Sloane, dismounting. He started down, leading Nagger. The Mustang followed. Sloan kept to the wall side of the trail, fearing the horses might slip. The snow held firmly at first, and Sloan had no trouble. The gap in the rim rock widened to a slope thickly grown over with cedars and pinions and manzanita. This growth made the descent more laborious, yet afforded means at least for Sloan to go down with less danger. There was no stopping. Once started, the horses had to keep on. Sloan saw the impossibility of ever climbing out while that snow was there. The trail zigzagged down and down. Very soon the yellow wall hung tremendously over him, straight up. The snow became thinner and softer. The horses began to slip. They slid on their haunches. Fortunately, the slope grew less steep, and Sloan could see below where it reached out to comparatively level ground. Still, a mishap might yet occur. Sloan kept as close to Nagger as possible, helping him whenever he could do it. The Mustang slipped, rolled over, and then slipped past Sloan, went down the slope to bring up in a cedar. Sloan worked down to him and extricated him. Then the huge nagger began to slide. Snow and loose rock slid with him, and so did Sloan. The little avalanche stopped of its own accord, and then Sloan dragged nagger on down and down, presently to come to the end of the steep descent. Sloan looked up to see that he had made short work of a thousand-foot slope. Here, cedars and pinions grew thickly enough to make a forest. The snow thinned out to patches and then failed. But the going remained bad for a while as the horses sank deep in the soft red earth. This eventually grew more solid and finally dry. Sloan worked out of the cedars to what appeared a grassy plateau enclosed by the great green and white slope with its yellow wall overhanging and distant mesas and cliffs. Here his view was restricted. He was down on the first bench of the great canyon, and there was the deer trail, a well-worn path keeping to the edge of the slope. Sloan came to a deep cut in the earth, and the trail headed it, where it began at the last descent of the slope. It was the source of a canyon. He could look down to see the bare, worn rock, and a hundred yards from where he stood, the earth was washed from its rims, and it began to show depth, and something of that ragged outline which told of violence of flood. The trail headed many canyons like this, all running down across this bench, disappearing, dropping invisibly. The trail swung to the left under the great slope, and then presently it climbed to a higher bench. Here were brush and grass and huge patches of sage, so pungent that it stung Sloane's nostrils. Then he went down again, this time to come to a clear brook lined by willows. Here the horses drank long, and Sloane refreshed himself. The sun had grown hot. There was fragrance of flowers he could not see, and a low murmur of a waterfall that was likewise invisible. For most of the time his view was shut off, but occasionally he reached a point where through some break he saw towers gleaming red in the sun. A strange place, a place of silence and smoky veils in the distance. Time passed swiftly. Toward the waning of the afternoon, he began to climb what appeared to be a saddle of land, connecting the canyon wall to the left 
with a great plateau, gold-rimmed and pine-fringed, rising more and more in his way as he advanced. At sunset, Sloan was more shut in than for several hours. He could tell the time was sunset by the golden light on the cliff wall again overhanging him. The slope was gradual up to this pass to the saddle, and upon coming to a spring and the first pine trees, he decided to halt for camp. The Mustang was almost exhausted. Thereupon, he hobbled the horses in the luxuriant grass round the spring, and then unrolled his pack. Once, as dusk came stealing down, while he was eating his meal, Nagger whistled in fright. Sloan saw a gray, pantherish form gliding away into the shadows. He took a quick shot at it, but missed. "'It's a lion country, all right,' he said." And then he set about building a big fire on the other side of the grassy plot, so as to have the horses between fires. He cut all the venison into strips and spent an hour roasting them. Then he lay down to rest, and he said, "'Wonder where Wildfire is tonight. Am I closer to him? Where is he heading for?' The night was warm and still. It was black near the huge cliff, and overhead velvety blue, with stars of white fire. It seemed to him that he had become more thoughtful and observing of the aspects of his wild environment, and he felt a welcome consciousness of loneliness. Then sleep came to him, and the night seemed short. In the gray dawn he arose refreshed. The horses were restive. Nagger snorted a welcome. Evidently they had passed an uneasy night. Sloan found lion tracks at the spring and in sandy places. Presently, he was on his way up to the notch between the great wall and the plateau. A growth of thick scrub oak made travel difficult. It had not appeared far up to that saddle, but it was far. There were straggling pine trees and huge rocks that obstructed his gaze. But once up, he saw that the saddle was only a narrow ridge, curved to slope up on both sides. Straight before Sloan and under him opened the canyon, blazing and glorious along the peaks and ramparts, where the rising sun struck, misty and smoky and shadowy, down in those mysterious steps. It took an effort not to keep on gazing, but Sloan turned to the grim business of his pursuit. The trail he saw leading down had been made by Indians. It was used probably once a year by them, and also by wild animals, and it was exceedingly steep and rough. Wildfire had paced to and fro along the narrow ridge of that saddle, making many tracks before he had headed down again. Sloan imagined that the great stallion had been daunted by the tremendous chasm, but had finally faced it, meaning to put this obstacle between him and his pursuers. It never occurred to Sloan to attribute less intelligence to wildfire than that, so dismounting, Sloan took Nagger's bridle and started down. The mustang with the pack was reluctant. He snorted and whistled and pawed the earth but he would not be left alone, so he followed. The trail led down under the cedars that fringed a precipice. Sloan was aware of this without looking. He attended only to the trail and to his horse. Only an Indian could have picked out that course, and it was cruel to put a horse to it. But Nagger was powerful, sure-footed, and he would go anywhere that Sloan led him. Gradually, Sloan worked down and away from the bulging rim wall. It was hard, rough work, and risky, because it could not be accomplished slowly. Brush and rocks, loose shale and weathered slope, long, dusty inclines of yellow earth and jumbles of stone. These made bad going for miles of slow, zigzag trail down out of the cedars. Then the trail entered what appeared to be a ravine. That ravine became a canyon. At its head, it was a dry wash full of gravel and rocks. 
It began to cut deep into the bowels of the earth. It shut out sight of the surrounding walls and peaks. Water appeared from under a cliff and, augmented by other springs, became a brook, hot, dry, and barren at its beginning. This cleft became cool and shady and luxuriant, with grass and flowers and amber moss with silver blossoms. The rocks had changed color from yellow to deep red. Four hours of turning and twisting endlessly down and down over boulders and banks and every conceivable roughness of earth and rock finished the pack mustang and Sloane mercifully left him in a long reach of canyon where grass and water never failed. In this place, Sloane halted for the noon hour, letting Nagger have his fill of the rich grazing. Nagger's three days in grassy upland, despite the continuous travel by day, had improved him. He looked fat, and Sloane had not yet caught the horse resting. Nagger was iron to endure, here Sloane left all the outfit except what was on his saddle and the sack containing the few pounds of meat and supplies and the two utensils. This sack he tied to the back of his saddle and resumed his journey. Presently he came to a place where wildfire had doubled on his trail and had turned up a side canyon. The climb out was hard on Sloane, if not on Nagger. Once up, Sloane found himself upon a wide, barren plateau of glaring red rock and clumps of greasewood and cactus. The plateau was miles wide, shut in by great walls and mesas of colored rock. The afternoon sun beat down fiercely. A blast of wind, as if from a furnace, swept across the plateau, and it was laden with red dust. Sloane walked here, where he could have ridden, and he made several miles of up-and-down progress over this rough plateau. The great walls of the opposite side of the canyon loomed appreciably closer. What, Sloane wondered, was at the bottom of this rent in the earth. The great desert river was down there, of course, but he knew nothing of it. Would that turn back wildfire? Sloane thought grimly how he had always claimed Nagger to be part fish and part bird. Wildfire was not going to escape. By and by, only isolated mescal plants with long yellow-plumed spears broke the bare monotony of the plateau, and Sloane passed from red sand and gravel to a red soft shale, and from that to hard red rock. Here, Wildfire's tracks were lost, the first time in seven weeks, but Sloane had his direction down that plateau with the cleavage lines of canyons to right and left. At times, Sloane found a vestige of the old Indian trail, and this made him doubly sure of being right. He did not need to have Wildfire's tracks. He let Nagger pick the way, and the horse made no mistake in finding the line of least resistance. But that grew harder and harder. This bare rock, like a file, would soon wear wildfire's hoofs thin, and Sloane rejoiced. Perhaps somewhere down in this awful chasm, he and Nagger would have it out with the stallion. Sloane began to look far ahead, beginning to believe that he might see wildfire. Twice he had seen wildfire, but only at a distance. Then he had resembled a running streak of fire whence his name, which Sloane had given him. This bare region of rock began to be cut up into gullies. It was necessary to head them or to climb in and out. Miles of travel really meant little progress straight ahead, but Sloane kept on. He was hot and Nagger was hot, and that made hard work easier. Sometimes, on the wind, came a low thunder. Was it a storm or an avalanche slipping or falling water? He could not tell. The sound was significant and haunting. Of one thing he was sure, that he could not have found his back trail, but he divined he was never to retrace his steps on this journey. The stretch of broken plateau before him grew wilder and bolder of outline, darker in color, 
weirder in aspect, and progress across it grew slower, more dangerous. There were many places Nagger should not have been put to, where a slip meant a broken leg, but Sloane could not turn back, and something besides an indomitable spirit kept him going, kept him going. Again, the sound resembling thunder assailed his ears, louder this time. The plateau appeared to be ending in a series of great capes or promontories. Sloane feared he would soon come out upon a promontory from which he might see the impossibility of further travel. He felt relieved down in the gullies where he could not see far. He climbed out of one presently from which there extended a narrow ledge with a slant too perilous for any horse. He stepped out upon that with far less confidence than Nagger. To the right was a bulge of low wall, and a few feet to the left a dark precipice. The trail here was faintly outlined, and it was six inches wide and slanting as well. It seemed endless to Sloane that ledge. He looked only down at his feet and listened to Nagger's steps. The big horse trod carefully, but naturally, and he did not slip. That ledge extended in a long curve, turning slowly away from the precipice and descending a little at the further end. Sloane drew a deep breath of relief when he led Nagger up on level rock. Suddenly, a strange yet familiar sound halted Sloane as if he had been struck. The wild, shrill, high-pitched piercing whistle of a stallion nagger neighed a blast in reply and pounded the rock with his iron-shod hoofs with a thrill Sloane looked ahead there some few hundred yards distant on a promontory stood a red horse it's wildfire breathed Sloane tensely he could not believe his sight he imagined he was dreaming but as Nagger stamped and snorted defiance, Sloane looked with fixed and keen gaze and knew that beautiful picture was no lie. Wildfire was as red as fire. His long mane, wild in the wind, was like a whipping, black-streaked flame. Silhouetted there against that canyon background, he seemed gigantic, a demon horse, ready to plunge into fiery depths. He was looking back over his shoulder, his head very high, and every line of him was instinct with wildness. Again, he sent out that shrill, air-splitting whistle. Sloane understood it to be a clarion call to Nagger. If Nagger had been alone, Wildfire would have killed him. The Red Stallion was a killer of horses. All over the Utah ranges, he had left the trail of a murderer. Nagger understood this, too, for he whistled back in rage and terror. It took an iron arm to hold him. Then Wildfire plunged, apparently down, and vanished from Sloan's sight. Sloan hurried onward to be blocked by a huge crack in the rocky plateau. This he had to head and then another and like obstacle checked his haste to reach that promontory. He was forced to go more slowly. Wildfire had been close only as to sight, and this was the great canyon that dwarfed distance and magnified proximity. Climbing down and up, toiling on, he at last learned patience. He had seen Wildfire at close range. That was enough. So he plodded on, once more returning to careful regard of Nagger. It took an hour of work to reach the point where Wildfire had disappeared. A promontory indeed it was, overhanging a valley a thousand feet below. A white torrent of a stream wound through it. There were lines of green cottonwoods following the winding course, then Sloane saw Wildfire slowly crossing the flat toward the stream. He had gone down that cliff, which to Sloane looked perpendicular. Wildfire appeared to be walking lame. Sloane, making sure of this, suffered a pang. Then, 
when the significance of such lameness dawned upon him he whooped his wild joy and waved his hat the red stallion must have heard for he looked up then he went on again and waded into the stream where he drank long when he started to cross the swift current drove him back in several places the water wreathed white around him but evidently it was not deep and finally he crossed from the other side he looked up again at nagger and sloan and going on he soon was out of sight in the cottonwoods how to get down muttered sloan there was a break in the cliff wall a bare stone slant where horses had gone down and come up that was enough for sloan to know he would have attempted the descent if he were sure no other horse but wildfire had ever gone down there but sloan's hair began to rise stiff on his head a horse like wildfire and mountain sheep and indian ponies were all very different from nagger the chances were against nagger come on old boy if i can do it you can he said sloan had never seen a trail as perilous as this he was afraid for his horse a slip there meant death the way nagger trembled in every muscle showed his feelings but he never flinched he would follow sloan anywhere providing sloan rode him or led him and here as riding was impossible sloan went before if the horse slipped there would be a double tragedy for nagger would knock his master off the cliff sloan set his teeth and stepped down he did not let nagger see his fear he was taking the greatest risk he had ever run the break in the wall led to a ledge and the ledge dropped from step to step and these had bare slippery slants between them nagger was splendid on a bad trail he had methods peculiar to his huge build and great weight he crashed down over the stone steps both front hoofs at once the slants he slid down on his haunches with his forelegs stiff and the iron shoes scraping he snorted and heaved and grew wet with sweat he tossed his head at some of the places but he never hesitated and it was impossible for him to go slowly whenever sloan came to corrugated stretches in the trail he felt grateful but these were few the rock was like smooth red iron sloan had never seen such hard rock it took him long to realize that it was marble his heart seemed a tense painful knot in his breast as if it could not beat holding back in the strained suspense but nagger never jerked on the bridle he never faltered many times he slipped often with both front feet but never with all four feet so he did not fall and the red wall began to loom above sloan then suddenly he seemed brought to a point where it was impossible to descend it was a round bulge slanting fearfully with only a few rough surfaces to hold a foot wildfire had left a broad clear-swept mark at that place and red hairs on some of the sharp points he had slid down below was an offset that fortunately prevented further sliding sloan started to walk down this place but when nagger began to slide sloan had to let go the bridle and jump both he and the horse landed safely luck was with them and they went on down and down to reach the base of the great wall scraped and exhausted wet with sweat but unhurt as sloan gazed upward he felt the impossibility of believing what he knew to be true he hugged and petted the horse then he led on to the roaring stream it was green water white with foam sloan waded in and found the water cool and shallow and very swift he had to hold to nagger to keep from being swept downstream they crossed in safety there in the sand showed wildfire's tracks and here were signs of another indian camp half a year old the shade of the cottonwoods was pleasant 
Sloan found this valley oppressively hot. There was no wind, and the sand blistered his feet through his boots. Wildfire held to the Indian trail that had guided him down into this wilderness of worn rock and that trail crossed the stream at every turn of the twisting, narrow valley. Sloan enjoyed getting into the water. He hung his gun over the pommel and let the water roll him. A dozen times he and Nagger forded the rushing torrent. Then they came to a box-like closing of the valley to canyon walls, and here the trail evidently followed the stream bed. There was no other way. Sloan waded in and stumbled, rolled, and floated ahead of the sturdy horse. Nagger was wet to his breast, but he did not fall. This gulch seemed full of a hollow, rushing roar. It opened out into a wide valley, and Wildfire's tracks took to the left side and began to climb the slope. Here the traveling was good, considering what had been passed. Once up out of the valley floor, Sloan saw Wildfire far ahead, high on the slope. He did not appear to be limping, but he was not going fast. Sloan watched as he climbed. What and where would be the end of this chase? Sometimes Wildfire was plain in his sight for a moment, but usually he was hidden by rocks. The slope was one great talus, a jumble of weathered rock, fallen from what appeared a mountain of red and yellow wall. Here the heat of the sun fell upon him like fire. The rocks were so hot Sloan could not touch them with bare hand. The close of the afternoon was approaching, and this slope was interminably long. Still, it was not steep, and the trail was good. At last, from the height of slope, wildfire appeared, looking back and down. Then he was gone. Sloan plodded upward. Long before he reached that summit, he heard the dull rumble of the river. It grew to be a roar, yet it seemed distant. Would the great desert river stop wildfire in his flight? Sloan doubted it. He surmounted the ridge to find the canyon opening in a tremendous gap, and to see down, far down, a glittering, sun-blasted slope merging into a deep black gulch where a red river swept and chafed and roared somehow the river was what he had expected to see a force that had cut and ground this canyon could have been nothing but a river like that the trail led down and sloan had no doubt that it crossed the river and led up out of the canyon he wanted to stay there and gaze endlessly and listen. At length, he began the descent. As he proceeded, it seemed that the roar of the river lessened. He could not understand why this was so. It took half an hour to reach the last level, a ghastly black and iron-ribbed canyon bed, with the river splitting it. He had not had a glimpse of wildfire on this side of the divide, but he found his tracks, and they led down off the last level, through a notch in the black bank of marble to a sandbar and the river. Wildfire had walked straight off the sand into the water. Sloan studied the river and the shore. The water ran slow, heavy, and sluggish eddies. From far up the canyon, came the roar of a rapid, and from below the roar of another, heavier and closer. The river appeared tremendous, in ways Sloan felt rather than realized, yet it was not swift. Studying the black rough wall of rock above him, he saw marks where the river had been sixty feet higher than where he stood on the sand. It was low then, how lucky for him that he had gotten there before flood season. He believed Wildfire had crossed easily, and he knew Nagger could make it. Then he piled and tied his supplies and weapons high on the saddle to keep them dry, and looked for a place to take to the water. Wildfire had sunk deep before reaching the edge. Manifestly, he had lunged the last few feet. Sloan found a better place and waded in urging Nagger. 
the big horse plunged, almost going under, and began to swim. Sloane kept upstream behind him. He found presently that the water was thick and made him tired, so it was necessary to grasp a stirrup and be towed. The river appeared only a few hundred feet wide, but probably it was wider than it looked. Nagger labored heavily near the opposite shore. Still, he landed safely upon a rocky bank. There were patches of sand in which wildfire's tracks showed so fresh that the water had not yet dried out of them. Sloan rested his horse before attempting the climb out of that split in the rock. However, wildfire had found an easy ascent. On this side of the canyon, the bare rock did not predominate. A clear trail led up a dusty, gravelly slope, upon which scant greasewood and cactus appeared. Half an hour's climbing brought Sloan to where he could see that he was entering a vast valley, sloping up and narrowing to a notch in the dark cliffs, above which towered the great red wall, and about that the slopes of cedar and the yellow rim rock. And scarcely a mile distant, Right in the westering sunlight shone the red stallion, moving slowly. Sloan pressed on steadily. Just before dark, he came to an ideal spot to camp. The valley had closed up so that the lofty walls cast shadows that met. A clump of cottonwood surrounding a spring, abundance of rich grass, willows, and flowers lining the banks, formed an oasis in the bare valley. Sloan was tired out from the day of ceaseless toil up and down, and he could scarcely keep his eyes open. But he tried to stay awake. The dead silence of the valley, the dry fragrance, the dreaming walls, the advent of night low down. When up on the ramparts, the last red rays of the sun lingered, the strange loneliness, these were sweet and comforting to him and that night's sleep was as a moment. He opened his eyes to see the crags and towers and peaks and domes and the lofty walls of that vast, broken chaos of canyons across the river. They were now emerging from the misty gray of dawn, growing pink and lilac and purple under the rising sun. He arose and set about his few tasks, which, being soon finished, allowed him an early start. Wildfire had grazed along no more than a mile in the lead. Sloan looked eagerly up the narrowing canyon, but he was not rewarded by the sight of the stallion. As he progressed up a gradually ascending trail, he became aware of the fact that the notch he had long looked up to was where the great red walls closed in and almost met and the trail zigzagged up this narrow vent, so steep that only a few steps could be taken without rest. Sloan toiled up for an hour, an age, till he was wet, burning, choked with the great weight on his chest. Yet still he was only halfway up that awful break between the walls. Sometimes he could have tossed a stone down upon a part of the trail, only a few rods below, yet many, many weary steps of actual toil. As he got farther up, the notch widened. What had been scarcely visible from the valley below was now colossal in actual dimensions. The trail was like a twisted mile of thread between two bulging mountain walls, leaning their ledges and fronts over this tilted pass. Sloan rested often. Nagger appreciated this and heaved gratefully at every halt. In this monotonous toil, Sloan forgot the zest of his pursuit, and when Nagger suddenly snorted in fright, Sloan was not prepared for what he saw. Above him ran a low red wall around which, evidently, the trail led. At the curve, which was a promontory, scarcely a hundred feet in an airline above him, he saw something red, moving, bobbing, coming out into view. It was a horse. Wildfire, no farther away than the length of three lassos. There he stood looking down. He fulfilled all of Sloane's dreams, 
only he was bigger. But he was so magnificently proportioned that he did not seem heavy. His coat was shaggy and red. It was not glossy. The color was what made him shine. His mane was like a crest, mounting, then falling low. Sloan had never seen so much muscle on a horse. Yet his outline was graceful, beautiful. The head was indeed that of the wildest of all wild creatures, a stallion born wild, and it was beautiful, savage, splendid, everything but noble. Sloan thought that if a horse could express hate, surely Wildfire did then. It was certain that he did express curiosity and fury. Sloan shook a gantleted fist at the stallion, as if the horse were human. That was a natural action for a rider of his kind. Wildfire turned away, showed bright against the dark background, and then disappeared. End of chapter two, part two. Recording by Myra Parker.